Hello everyone, in today's tactics video I'm going to discuss my thoughts towards deployment. A crucial step in the game, I thought I'd share my perspective on it and hopefully it helps you in your games. Naturally this would really help any newer players but possibly also the more experienced of you. This is clearly aimed at Astromilitarum commanders or probably also apply to all other armies. Like all my other videos, please leave your thoughts and questions in the comments below. I always read them and try to get back to any questions, and I also uh, learn a lot from you as I do so. In the background you see a recent game I played against a friend of mine called Adam who plays Black Templars. I'll refer to this deployment at several points, um, and a crucial place to start is understanding the mission. So the game me and Adam are playing is on the deployment zone sweeping engagement with his diagonal deployment and five objectives. The mission rule was targets of opportunity, allowing you to have three secondary objective cards in your hand at, at once. And the primary objective was Scorched Earth, where it rewards you five for holding one, an additional five for holding a second. You also score an additional five points for burning an objective that's in no man land, um, or ten if you burn an objective in your opponent's deployment zone. So from that, the key detail here is you can score a max of ten by holding two objectives, and a bonus of 5 or 10 if you burn another. This meant all you need to obviously do is probably hold just your own objective and one in no man's land. This is an early consideration that needs to be factored with understanding the terrain. As you can see we're playing on pretty standard tournament style terrain where the footprint of the terrain piece is obscuring with a unit uh, made visible as soon as it's on the terrain piece. All walls count as being fully enclosed and true line of sight blocking when a unit is behind them. As you can see the majority of the deployment zone as marked by my dice is nicely protected with only the bottom right being exposed. It does have a nice clear view of your opponent's deployment zone and the home objective but to deploy there will be super risky because if you don't get first turn the units will be sitting ducks. The next key thing to think about and understand is your opponent's army. Adam's list is a balanced Black Templar list with two Plasma Incinerator Redemptor Genauts, uh, two Lancer tanks, two Impulsors with a primary Stabby Dudes inside, two squads of Infiltrators, um, a Kalidus Assassin, several Black Templar characters, and a single squad of Voidsmen and Arms for some chaff. As you can see, my list is quite shooty with numerous Lascan and equipped Sentinels and two Lemon Rust Vanquishers. Being pessimistic here, Adam's Dreadnoughts and Lancers are stronger shooters than mine, so I had to keep this in my mind whilst deploying my army, making sure it didn't give away um, any line of sight turn 1 if I went second. Also, I did know that Adam had limited ways to get off a turn 1 charge, with this being a huge threat in some uh, matchups. I'm not 100% sure how common they are in 10th edition, but in 9th edition, Drakari and Orcs could pull them off quite easily resulting in you being all scummed up in a deployment zone, being unable to score points. If this is a threat in a game you're playing, make sure you pre-measure from your opponent's deployment zone and deploy units outside this range, making sure you measure the maximum distance um, their furthest unit could move. Do of course make sure to ask your opponent the unit's maximum distance, including any fancy tricks via stratagems. Um, and the other way to manage this is to potentially deploy some of your cheap chaff units up front inviting the charge and leaving enough space between them and the rest of your army for then your heavy hitting um, guns to blast the charging units apart after they've made the charge and potentially your chaff units fall back. Personally I prefer the first method and controlling which units are charged at a later point in the game. Now as mentioned earlier Adam has two squads of infiltrators whilst I have just Sly Marbo. Infiltration units are a great mission play unit that can enable early board control. Adam deployed a squad of infiltrators in the bottom right hand objective and I did likewise in the top left. Here I did my very best to make sure any charges from Adam's deployment zone were as long as possible if slide my bird was to be threatened. Given infiltration units must be more than 9 inches away from your opponent's deployment zone and other units, Sly's placement screened out his second infiltration squad. Also, now knowing where Adam uh, did place his infiltrators, then I had to factor this in when I placed my other units on the table, given their threat of a potential turn one charge. Now, we both started to then deploy um, our remaining units, and I started here with what I'd call my less uh, important units, with the indirect fire units, command squads, and sentinels. 
Here the principle is to force your opponent to deploy their best units, giving you uh, deploy your uh, less important ones first. Um, you're then forcing your opponent to show their intent, whilst they don't know where your best units will be placed. My biggest threats to Adam early on were the Vanquisher Lim and Rust Battle Tanks and my single Armager Knight, which I deployed quite late in the piece. On the flip side of this, you may um, be playing more hyper-aggressive, and maybe you want to do so with your best units being deployed first, signposting which side of the board you intend to own, or try to scare your opponent off. Which method you use depends of course on the opponent you face. If they do have limited shooting output, you could be mega aggressive with your um, heavy shooters, putting them um, up quite aggressively. But on the flip side, if you're playing into say tower which boosts a devastating amount of firepower, you would have to be a bit more timid. Now related to this, it's important to think of where your units will all fit in the tabletop. This sounds super obvious, but you don't want to discover that you haven't left enough room to place your units or you box one in. An example of boxing in would be, say for example, a Lemon Rust battle tank being placed behind two basilisks, requiring a game of Tetris to get Lemon Rust out of the car park and forcing the basilisk to move, and then a uh, meaning born soldiers doesn't work anymore. Again, this is super obvious, but in a high unit count army like Imperial Guard, it's something to be very aware of. Right next, related to this, is uh, pre measuring your first turn moves. My list has 3x2 Scout Sentinels with their pre-game 9-inch move and a single squad of Catagens in a Chimera with their 6-inch pre-game move. Here I was a bit more aggressive with them, knowing I could move them into cover before the game begin. The same principle can be applied to your remaining units, setting them up so they can quickly move onto an objective or getting them into cover. Pre-planning is a key principle of competitive 40k and I honestly don't do it enough but it should be applied to almost everything you do. You could, for example, uh, pre-measure the move of a limb and rust to see what line of sight it will draw and then what the range of its weapons will reach out to. The same applies to charging or being charged, as mentioned earlier. Same thing also applies um, to which units can move on to an objective. Obviously, guard have the um, order uh, move, 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 giving you an additional three inch movement which when combined with an advance roll, could see a scout sentinel moving an average of 16 inches. A sideways point here is to always uh, work to averages on things like advance and charge rolls. Don't for example assume needing a five inch advance roll or a nine inch charge is something to base your entire game plan off, because uh, more often than not, you simply won't achieve that dice roll. Right now to consideration for 10th edition, being don't start units on an objective in turn one. The reason for this is that um, the secondary objective overwhelming force awards 5 victory points for destroying units on an objective. If I went second for example and Adam managed to charge a unit onto Sly Marber and kill him, if he was on the objective he would give away an easy 5 victory points. I do actually uh, break this principle, placing an infantry squad um, with a Sala Creed onto my home objective, however destroying them would be quite tough for Adam given he doesn't have any indirect fire weapons. Of course for us, being an indirect fire army means this uh, should be something we can easily do from turn one. In subsequent turns, of course, get units onto objectives to score the primary. Related to this point, and also consideration for 10th edition again, is keeping chaff units uh, near table quarters. The secondary objective, investigate signal, requires a unit to be wholly within nine inches of a table quarter to, to score two victory points for every table quarter they perform the action in. Of course, any unit can do this, but why would you waste a turn of shooting on, say, a basilisk or manticore when an infantry squad can do so? Again, you are catering for a single a a secondary objective of a total of 16 objectives, but when it does come up, you want to be well prepared. It would also interact nicely with engage or fronts, given the units in table corners are well within the table quarter. Okay, getting towards the end of everything, um, another point to consider is your opponent's deep strike or reinforcement units. These can come in generally from turn two, with Space Marine drop pods able to do so in turn one, presenting a real headache if they do land. Again, you should be planning for this, having your screens up, and I said uh, before, Sly Marbo screened at the top left corner, and I used my Scout Sentinels also uh, to achieve this. 
Again, thanks to their pre-game move of 9 inches, um, they would further push out any screens even more. So even if your opponent did go first, uh, the deep striking uh, drop pods would be screened right out. Screening should never be a problem for Astra Militarum, given we usually have got plenty of units. Of course, make sure all areas of your deployment zone are screened out early and for the entire game. And again, pre-measure um, the placement of units so there's less than 9 inches between uh, them and the table edge. Understand which enemy units can deep strike, uh, as deep striking a single model is a lot easier, obviously, than deep striking 10, for example. And finally, on the flip side of this, is our reinforcements or deep strike units. In 10th edition, putting units in reinforcements costs you nothing, which is different to previous editions of 40k. Don't be afraid to put units into reinforcements, as they obviously provide excellent flexibility, but again, balance this against your opponent's lists. If they do have a ton of hyper-fast moving units uh, that are able to screen the entire board, then the effectiveness or deep strike um, or, or reinforcements would be reduced. Related to this is the uh, final piece to think about is our um, any redeployment abilities. Lord Solar's ability to redeploy three Astra Miller time units is a great rule. You can use it simply to correct any mistakes you've made, um, uh, stick units in reinforcements, or completely change your deployment zone layout. Say, for example, your opponent has deployed super aggressive on one side of the board, you could react accordingly. Or a more tangible example in this game we played is to say with infiltration units. Let's imagine Adam uh, deployed some infiltrators 9 inches away from Sly Marbo, meaning turn 1 hit could be a threat. I could have simply picked him up and redeployed him to safety. 40k to a limited degree is like a game of chess, where everything your opponent and yourself do have in consequence. So I had to think about what would happen if Sly Marbo was charged, for example, uh, what opportunity would it pre uh, present to me. Um, I could have cleverly placed him so any charges made um, the enemy unit stick out in the open, uh, ready to be shot down into pieces uh, t for my tanks to take revenge for their lost Sly Marbo friend. All right, so there you have it, uh, my thoughts and tips on deployment in 10th edition. Hopefully helpful to you, and if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. Likewise, I'd love to hear from any of you out there with your thoughts on this topic. Um, deployment isn't necessarily something that will win you games, but it's definitely something that can lose you games. So yep, if you uh, enjoy this and want to support me, you can do so with a like, comment, or by subscribing, joining my Patreon platoon, or simply watching any of my other YouTube videos. A massive thanks to my current supporters. Let's get your bayonet sharp, let's go oiled. Faith from the Emperor Strong, Patreon platoon, sound off. Tank Commander Glenn. Tank Commander Watchdog Van Etten Tank Commander Mitchell Lieutenant Burke Nielsen Colour Sergeant DuPont Sergeants Adal, The Colonel Merrill Veteran Gibson, Hall, Lundine Guardsman Beard, Coquelin, Flint, Hills, Malik, Nitten, Nguyen, Smith, Tom, Tompkin Conscript England, Gillian Goodwin King.